thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is a good uh, practical topic, I think, for, for a lot of, uh, really for any um, entrepreneur or business owner, uh, but we're gonna hit on some issues that specifically uh, deal with the folks in the uh, business of healthcare. Uh, and, and we're going to break this down into uh, different areas from the setup of, from, of a business through uh, dealing with actual threats and lawsuits. And hopefully a lot of the stuff that we tell you in the beginning uh, will keep you out of a lot of the uh, events that we discuss on the back end. So with that, I am going to uh, move in because I've got quite a bit of material that I can cover today. And... Uh, I, I do invite and encourage your questions. If you have a question you want to drop it into the uh, question box, I will monitor that here on the screen. And uh, if there's for some reason a question that we don't get to today and you want to, uh, as you think of it later and you want to address it, then please let me know and we will uh, we can set up a time to have a call or an email or something of that nature. So uh, when we're talking about um, uh, protecting yourself from legal risk and dealing with uh, risk management and healthcare. Really, what we want to do is, is first uh, focus on the setup, focus on uh, proactive steps that you can take before problems arise to uh, minimize the impact of any uh, legal issues later or reduce or eliminate the legal issues that can come down the road. And uh, as we go through, this is what I, I mentioned in the beginning here, the sort of an agenda of, of what we're gonna be talking about. And this is uh, also tracks the life cycle of business in a sense. And this is uh, dealing with the, the setup of your business from the very beginning, business operations, then dealing with disputes and threats. And we'll also talk about you know most common threats and, and where they can come from. Uh, and then if you are uh, engaged in a lawsuit or some type when I'd say lawsuit, I should use it probably really a, a legal proceeding because more and more now we're seeing, uh, and I'm writing into contracts, mandatory arbitration provisions and other mechanisms of dispute resolution. Uh, so really it's lawsuits and other dispute resolution uh, proceedings. Uh, and then at the end, if we have a little bit of time, I'll take any questions that you have. So like, a, uh, like any good plan, we start with the end in mind and, uh, and, and realize that setting up a solid uh, business and personal structure can, uh, can help you not only in avoiding legal risks and issues that can arise later, but also in your negotiating leverage. And what I mean by that is um, things like separating your business assets and your personal assets, and then even among your business assets, creating a structure uh, that creates separation. So case in point, I just talked to a uh, somebody just the other day that's now become a new client of ours. And uh, and this person set up their business and they, they did the right thing. They went, they did have an attorney that helped them, but I, I don't think it was done properly, frankly. Uh, I'm not mentioning any names here, but this is quite common. Uh, they have a, they have their business operations. So they have a healthcare practice and that healthcare practice is operating, um, it, from what I can tell, they're operating under a DBA. Uh, so it's not a separate entity. They created one entity and uh, they call that entity the parent company. That's apparently what they were advised by their uh, former counsel is create a parent company and then create subsidiaries under that parent company, but they didn't do it properly. Uh, they created a parent company but it's not really a parent company. It's one company that owns real estate and it owns the building in which they operate the practice. And then they run the practice through a DBA under the same ownership entity. Uh, the obvious uh, or maybe not so obvious problem with that is if they have some type of liability that impacts their business, if they get sued or threatened with suit, this can come from anything from a, uh, a malpractice claim, a claimed uh, privacy violation, uh, or just a, an unpaid business loan. Last year, uh, while we were uh, dealing with uh, shutdown issues, a lot of folks had lines of credit and loans that uh, were tough to pay or impossible to pay during the shutdown. So they have some issue like that. Now, uh, 
whoever that potential creditor is, be it a, a anybody from a patient to a bank, a, a landlord, when they have a claim against the business, uh, they also have a claim against any other assets that are tied to that business within the same business entity. So if you have a structure where you have real estate owned by the business that's operating, you now have any claim against the operating business can be recoverable against the assets of the entity. So uh, if I set up ABC Corporation or ABC LLC, and that owns uh, property at one main street and also my, uh, my uh, dental practice, if my dental practice has a claim or a debt and ends up owing somebody a million dollars, that creditor can now go after not only any of the assets in, used in the dental practice, but any assets of ABC LLC, uh, which includes the real estate. That's a big problem. And uh, we help people avoid that by setting up a proper structure, both from a personal standpoint, and from a business standpoint. A lot of this involves you know, personal asset protection or at least personal planning to uh, make sure you, you've done what you can to keep uh, assets from being exposed or overexposed. This can be something as simple as uh, if you are in a high risk profession, if you're a physician or you're like me, an attorney, and you have a spouse who stays home and, and has the tougher job of, of taking care of the family at home, but mo much less risk. Hopefully, if you have young children, they're not yet threatening to sue you. Um, you have a, a situation where one spouse is very unlikely to be sued. Another spouse is in a high risk uh, area where they could be sued. If you identify assets and, and title assets as marital assets, those assets, and that would be tenants by entireties, those assets are not available to creditors of the individual spouse. Something that simple. You can identify bank accounts, all my bank accounts, financial accounts, any significant assets uh, are titled that way. And so anybody with a claim against Eric is, is very limited on what they can recover unless they also have a claim against Heather, which is uh, just not going to happen. Plus, my wife's too nice. Nobody's going to go after her. Um, on a business side, it's the same idea. You want to segregate different business operations. If you are a, uh, let's say, a home health care business, for instance, and you have different lines of, of, of care, and maybe you have a DME division, perhaps you even want to set, separate out different assets um, according to business operations. So if there's a claim in one line of operations, it doesn't bring down the entire structure. So depending on your size, depending on what you do, this can be customized, uh, but please understand what is available. Now, uh, not only setting up your structure, but also uh, we want to encourage folks to uh, document your business relationships with uh, solid agreements. Sometimes other parties provide agreements and, uh, and we review those, we negotiate those, mark those up, we draft agreements. But I like to look at agreements like uh, between parties as fences between neighbors. They identify the boundaries, identify what the party's expectations are um, and, and what the consequences are for not fulfilling those duties and obligations. Um, what type of stuff should be in an agreement? It depends, of course, on the, on the type of agreement we're talking about. But um, generally, uh, you want to have agreements to document your business structure. Uh, so what I was talking about earlier with parent companies, subsidiaries, different operating entities, you want to document all that with um, proper governance agreements, operating agreements, shareholder agreements where applicable, uh, employment agreements, um, and, and also certificates of ownership and uh, anything that would document the relationships between the parties and what the rights and responsibilities and duties are uh, with employees and contractors and, uh, and vendors. Uh, those agreements are going to look a little bit different. Um, we're going to have things in there that uh, not only identify what's being delivered, what type of services somebody is providing and how they're getting paid, but the term of the agreement, uh, what type of uh, representations are, and warranties parties are making in the delivery of their services or the products, um, remedies for failing to uh, perform. And, and in those types of agreements, we will often have things like um, we'll see non-solicitation provisions, anti-piracy provisions, uh, non-competes are very common in, in professional agreements. And we can look at those and understand that just because some of that language is in an agreement or somebody else prevent, presents it to you, uh, those types of uh, restrictive covenants and other provisions are very malleable. 
um, even if you can't eliminate, for instance, a restrictive covenant, the way those things are drafted can have dramatic effects on what the party's rights and, uh, and abilities to uh, uh, continue business outside the agreement, what happens uh, if the agreement does uh, become terminated. And then uh, last point here, as I put on the slide, uh, if you are entering into a relationship and something is important to you, make sure it's in an agreement. There are so many times when uh, when folks come to us after the fact and they say, well, you know, this is why I did this, or this is what was promised, or this is what we talked about. And I say, okay, where is it in the contract? Well, we talked about it. They know we talked about it. It's not in there. Uh, this can be something literally as simple and as rudimentary as a promise is made, you're entering into a contract, you're presented with a form contract, and you say, well, wait a minute, this doesn't include X, Y, and Z, and the other side confirms, well, yeah, we that that's included. Don't worry about it. Well, you know, you can you can trust us, you can you can count on us. Uh, you can do something just as simple as confirming that in a written email. You send an email and say, we talked about this, it wasn't in the agreement. I'm writing to confirm that this in fact is to be a part of the agreement. And and even better practice is to take that email and just staple it to the back of the agreement as uh, addendum one or exhibit one uh, and make it part of the agreement, incorporate it into the terms of the agreement. Uh, obviously there are better ways to do that, more thorough ways, but uh, if there's something that you want in your business relationship with another party, make sure that you have it in a written agreement. So some key points to take away from this, uh, timing is key. Trying to uh, create a proper structure after you have problems, and this is a, a recent client who came to me. Uh, now I'm taking a look at a structure where they have potential business liability and they've got exposed real estate. Chances are there's not a whole lot that we can do, whereas had we dealt with this situation before the liability arose, uh, we could create separation and protection. Uh, so you want to do this stuff early, buy your umbrella before it rains, as the saying goes. Um, also understand that sometimes there's a trade-off between structural control and protection. Uh, if you're going to have uh, different entities and you have multiple people who are involved, you may have to give up a little bit of control in order to create separation. Um, if you have one ownership group and they want to uh, have certain assets that are that are more protected, uh, than, than business assets that are in play, you're taking a little bit off the table, you may have to give up a little bit of control of your personal assets in order to create a greater level of protection. Some people want to do that, some people don't. Uh, a very good example of this is in, on the personal side, uh, if you create uh, a spendthrift trust, if you're going to create a trust for asset protection purposes, which you can't do a self-settled trust in Florida, but you can do self-settled trusts in offshore or in other jurisdictions, or if you're gonna create some type of mechanism like that, if you have control, a court will look at you later and say, well, you control it, you can compel that entity or that part of the trust, somebody to do something later. A court can compel you to make assets available. If you literally give up some level of control, then the argument later, if a court tries to unwind the protections that you've put in place, and this happens. You could have a lawsuit, something goes on, the parties try to, to bring assets together to, to, you know, by different arguments, uh, piercing the corporate veil, alter ego arguments where they, we treat one entity the same as another. There are multiple different legal theories, fraudulent transfer theories. If a court tries to compel a party to make assets available that aren't part of the structure that's in play, if that, if that party, if you can go into court and, and swear and, and give testimony and say, I have no control, I have no ability to do that, here's what the documents say, it's out of my control, uh, that's a very, uh, very strong argument and you're gonna have much more protection if that comes about. And I put here also, you know, have a team for this. When I, when I talk to new clients, I wanna know <clears throat> who's your uh, tax advisor and or your accountant, and some will have different, different folks. Who are you using? You, know, you should have somebody that you're relying on for uh, legal advice. It's nice to just have somebody to call uh, for with general legal questions, a regular go-to person. Uh, it may not be the same lawyer who handles every issue. Some issues are very complex and unique, but you should have a go-to person. Same as your accountant and, uh, and or a tax advisor, uh, maybe bookkeeper, insurance advisor. Uh, depending on, on your business, there may be some consultants. You may have... Um, uh, somebody who specifically advises you on uh, on technology and, and and digital privacy. You may have a HIPAA 
consultant or somebody that you rely on for, uh, for HIPAA issues and privacy issues. Uh, but definitely, as you start your business, you should consider who's part of your team, what pieces are missing, and how can you fill in those pieces so you have go-to folks to, uh, to address general questions before they become big problems. All right, we're going to move into the next phase here, and this is uh, on your business operations side. And uh, this is where there's a, there's a big focus and, and the idea of, uh, of compliance and, and risk management isn't going to be new to anybody on, on our call today, uh, but uh, I wanna hit on some of what I think are some of the key issues here. And, and that's first understanding legal compliance is, uh, exists at all levels. This is federal, state, and local compliance. Uh, you have administrative requirements, you have statutory requirements, um, you should also have internal controls, uh, some uh, practices, some especially larger uh, healthcare practices will do internal auditing, for instance, of billing and uh, encoding on a regular basis to uh, discover issues that need to be addressed before it becomes an issue with a third party payer, whether that be a government payer or a private payer. Um, also understand that uh, there's a difference when you when you're talking about compliance issues there's a difference between legal and practical recourse uh, the legal is more technical but some oftentimes i'm talking to a client and uh and the conversation will uh will discuss you know what are the specific legal requirements what are the uh, risks of uh, of, of non-compliance and and especially with other parties you know what if somebody else is not complying and then at a practical level you know, how do you solve problems? How do you address issues so that you can keep your business uh, running and operating uh, in a manner that's not so overly um, overly risk adverse that you're not uh, doing the things you need to do to expand your business and be an entrepreneur and uh, and and service your your patients or whoever your uh, target market is. Uh, so there's a, there's a distinct difference between uh, legal recourse and practical recourse, and a good attorney or advisor should be able to give you both of those uh, both of those answers. Uh, have in place, of course, you know, plans, policies, and systems uh, internally. Uh, you want to know, uh, and you want your employees to know. You want to have key folks who understand, for instance, uh, HIPAA and data protection. Uh, how do you handle crisis? How do you handle uh, audits from uh, private payers or from uh, from government uh, entities or contractors. Uh, you should have a policy on how you deal with these issues. How do you make sure, how do you handle document control and ensure that uh, your documents are not only uh, uh, complete and thorough, uh, but also secure and, uh, and, and access is limited to only those folks who uh, need, uh, need access to information and documents. Uh, on your external policies and, uh, and procedures, you uh, should have uh, you know, policies on how you deal with clients. Most folks have when you when you take on a new patient, uh, you have them acknowledge uh, things such as your payment policy, your privacy policy. Uh, perhaps uh, you have uh, even uh, policies dealing with uh, you what happens with scheduling appointments and missed appointments and follow up and and your you know, how you charge for different uh, different functions. Uh, you'll have this with, uh, with generally with your clients and with patients. You, to some degree, uh, if you're operating under a uh, uh, under a managed care contract or, or a similar regime, you'll be uh, constrained by the requirements of that regime. But you can still have uh, independent policies. Uh, many of my clients, for instance, have a, a policy that you know if they provide services, insurance doesn't cover those services, uh, depending on the context that, that uh, the client remains responsible for payment of those services. Uh, so consider what policies that you have and, and the way you develop these, sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's not so obvious in the beginning, but you have an issue that keeps recurring, an issue that's popping up over and over, and you, that should tell you, okay, we need a policy in place for this. Um, and then, you know, it's a good idea to get with an advisor, get with uh, legal counsel or somebody, you know, who's familiar with dealing with the legal issues and incorporating those into a practical result to create solutions for you. Uh, I also want to point out that um, 
if you fail in, in certain legal compliance areas, what we're seeing more and more now is uh, insurance companies. We're seeing payers uh, who are resisting payment for, uh, for alleged legal noncompliance. Uh, this could be something like uh, we believe you know, we're the insurance company. We're not going to pay because uh, we're not going to pay for an MRI because we believe that it was uh, an unlawful referral that was internally made in violation of the uh, Stark law or the uh, Florida patient uh, self-referral law. Uh, this could be we're not going to pay uh, a practitioner for a certain service because we don't believe the practitioner is properly licensed and acting within the scope of their license. Um, we're seeing this uh, without, uh, it's a public case, but I don't want to talk about names or anybody involved, but I'm involved right now in a, a pretty large scale uh, lawsuit where I represent some uh, physicians who've been sued for allegedly not providing uh, proper services under the Florida telehealth law. And when we look at the telehealth law in Florida, what we see is that it's not entirely clear. And in my view in this particular case, and, and I've been involved in it for a while, is that uh, that what the services and the manner in which the services were provided was perfectly in conformance with the telehealth law, but the insurance company takes the other view. But what has happened now is that uh, the insurance company doesn't want to pay claims. They probably don't, you know, they're resistant to the expansion of telehealth in, uh, in Florida and in other states because it makes it easier for folks to access services and easier for uh, providers to bill for those services if they don't have to meet face to face. Um, and so now I've got uh, folks who are defendants in lawsuits because uh, of allegedly not, not complying with a statute. Uh, and, and now we have to fight through that argument. So any way that you can avoid those issues by properly documenting your efforts in compliance is going to help you later if you ever have to deal with uh, lawsuits in that regard. More on operations. Uh, I'm, Presumably everybody on the webinar can read. If you do have any questions, of course, on any of this, uh, please feel free to, to shoot me a message. Um, but uh, you know, this gives you a good, good checklist. I think I talked about doing internal auditing for, uh, for uh, uh, billing and payments, um, understanding your uh, record keeping requirements. It's a good idea to have a digital compliance plan and an action plan for uh, any type of uh, potential breach. Uh, if you ever do get uh, audited uh, or you have to deal with uh, government authorities on uh, potential uh, violations of, of HIPAA or uh, high tech laws or, or data protection, uh, they are going to ask for your written policies and procedures on, uh, on data security and you should have something. Um, and not only should you have it, if it's prepared by a third party, make sure you've read it, make sure you're complying with it. Uh, it does no good to have a big binder of all of your data security processes and uh, mechanisms to protect information if you're not complying with it and you've never even opened it up to read it. So take a look at that. Make sure it's something you comply can comply with. In our law firm, uh, our uh, uh, essentially our, our data breach response plan, a, a, a disaster response plan, is sort of a, a checklist of items that we would go through. It kind of gives us a guiding uh, a guiding document if that ever happens. Not that we would, we haven't had to deal with that, but if it did, uh, that that whole document, which I drafted, uh, is uh, about two pages, not even quite two pages long. It's not a long document, but it's something that we can refer to right away. Okay, if we have an issue, all right, let's pull that out. Here's what we do. Um, again, I, I, I make mention of agreements. If we go in and we're going to look at a business for a, a compliance and risk management uh, type analysis, if I'm dealing with a new client and they want to go through that process, I'm going to want to see all of their agreements. By the way, this is a similar process. If you have a practice, uh, some type of uh, healthcare practice that you're able to, to eventually sell or you think you want to eventually sell, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today are, are the same things that you're going to see on a due diligence sheet later with any potential buyer. If somebody's going to come in and buy your business, they're going to want to see that you have all these policies and procedures in place, you have all your governing documents in place, and they're going to want to see your contracts, and they're going to want to see to, to know that these contracts are assignable or something that they're going to be able to get the benefit of if they buy your business. So not only are you uh, setting yourself up to protect yourself from legal liability, you're also setting yourself up to make you a, a, a better, juicier target in connection with any acquisition. And you better believe if they start digging into your documents and you've gotten a price on a, on a, uh, 
uh, an initial offer or a letter of intent and the due diligence starts and all of your documents are a mess and it looks like half of the, the business relationships you have might not be transferable or assignable to this new entity or that nobody, there's no documentation of those, of those relationships, that can affect the price. And you can expect that you may get, uh, you know, it, it, whatever the initial price was is X, it could be substantially less than that because there's more risk for the party coming in. Or if a party coming in thinks that you're not complying with legal requirements or you're not complying with the contracts that you have in place with your MCOs and other uh, organizations, uh, potential buyers will walk over that. They're, they're not going to want to buy into a potential litigation problem. So there's definitely a lot of business value in doing this on the front side. Probably the most value is uh, besides keeping you out of trouble and reducing your trouble later, also um, making yourself a better target in any potential acquisition. Pardon me as I take some water. And I gave you a couple notes here on uh, contracts and agreements and how to keep track of, uh, of what's important. One thing I, I encourage all clients to do is, is calendar timeframes in a contract. If you enter into a contract and it's renewable on an annual basis um, or it's subject to termination on each anniversary date with a certain amount of notice, stick that in your calendar. With Outlook and Google Calendar and all the different mechanisms we have today, there's no excuse to miss any of these deadlines. Once you stick that thing in a file or in a drawer, you may not look at it for another year. If you sign a five-year lease, um, give yourself a reminder four years out uh, to determine whether or not you're happy with the space and you think you're gonna stay, stay there. And then on top of that four years, give yourself another six months to determine whether you need to give notice to, uh, to your uh, landlord, if we're using the lease example, to terminate that agreement if you don't want to continue or to continue that agreement, depending on what the language of the document says. Uh, calendar all your timeframes uh, and a couple other points on contracts. If I want to hide terms in a document or I want to uh, narrowly define uh, certain uh, rights or responsibilities or obligations in a document, uh, lawyers love to use definitions. Uh, anything that's capitalized or underlined or bolded or in quotes in a document uh, typically uh, refers to a definition. So when you're reading a provision of a contract, sort of contract reading 101, you're reading a provision of a contract and you see a capitalized term and you think to yourself, what's that mean? Chances are it's defined somewhere in the document. A good contract, if it's, if it's lengthy, many good contracts will have a definitions section. Uh, if not, then you should scan the document, find out what that means. Uh, and then uh, I like to say that the boilerplate stuff that everybody thinks is the same uh, really isn't. Uh, first of all, you know, boilerplate, uh, one, what I draft, for instance, on uh, if I'm representing, let's say, an employer in, in connection with an employment agreement for a physician, uh, very common, I look at these all the time and I write them. If I'm writing from the employer's perspective, I may be drafting it one way. If I'm writing from the employee, uh, the potential hiring uh, prospects perspective, uh, I'm going to write it differently. Usually it's the employer that's drafting those, but there are many circumstances where uh, one party or the other will draft an agreement and, and the way I write language will be different, especially if you're uh, in different counties or different states, if you're dealing with vendors somewhere else, governing law and jurisdictional provisions become very important. All of this type of stuff, your dispute resolution, your remedies, your governing law, uh, how you solve problems, how you give notice if there's a problem. Uh, all of this stuff is, is going to be contained in the, in the contract that's often, often going to be at the end in your general terms and conditions. This is the stuff that everybody glosses over, but there are important points in here. Even if you're not looking at that closely and negotiating that with a contract, if something happens and a problem arises, you look to the contract and see, okay, what type of notice do we have to give? Where do we have to send notice? Uh, how much time do they have to respond to the notice? follow those provisions in the contract and, and even better yet, again, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a self plug here, but you know, it doesn't have to be me, but contact the lawyer. If problems come up, uh, get with somebody who really knows how to, how to work through these issues. Uh, I put a query down here, at, you know, what's the typical uh, optimum page length for a typical uh, agreement for services or employment? And uh, I would normally, if I was doing this in a live presentation, I would take answers. Uh, but the answer is, is almost seems kind of obvious when you think about it, as long as it needs to be to include everything that you need and not too long. <clears throat> if you get a 30-page document, which I've seen, I've seen, I've seen 30-page 
consulting uh, or, or uh, uh, independent uh, contractor services agreements and similarly long employment agreements that incorporate other documents, uh, you get a lot of redundancies and you often get a lot of conflicting provisions. It's also hard to cover all of the information that you want to put in a document in only two pages. Uh, typically, I like to shoot for something in the neighborhood of, you know, depending on the complexity, uh, actually, I don't really want to say a page length, but as long as it to cover everything, but not too long that you have contradictions in the document. All right. So similar uh, to some of the items we just discussed, when we talk about risk management in your business operations, um, some things to consider here. And these are just uh, random points that I included that I wanted to hit on today. Have a person in charge, somebody responsible for overseeing your risk management operation. If you are a, uh, if you're a small practice, that might be you. It might be an office manager. If you're larger, you may designate one or more folks or you may have a committee. Uh, these are the folks who uh, are responsible for monitoring operations to identify potential areas of risk or areas of need uh, and updating policies and procedures, pr preferably identifying situations where they need to, um, where you need to uh, update what you have or addressing new issues. As I mentioned earlier, if you have a recurring problem issue that keeps coming up, perhaps you need a written policy to deal with that. Uh, for, you know, if you're dealing with, like, for instance, with payment issues with patients. Uh, also, uh, have uh, specific pr procedures in place for obtaining and documenting informed consent. I put that, that in there because this is one of the biggest areas of uh, litigation from a malpractice perspective is, is folks who uh, get, uh, have procedures or receive services and then later claim that they never consented or they weren't properly informed about the services, either refuse to pay or even worse than refusing to pay sometimes is, is there is some type of complication and they claim they weren't aware of it. Uh, have a procedure in place for documenting this. Uh, also, uh, be very, uh, uh, you know, stick to your, stay in your lane, uh, stick to what you know and when you're dealing with issues that are outside your area of expertise, uh, don't be afraid to, to refer those to others who are expert in that area, or if you don't have a referral, don't be afraid to turn stuff down that could potentially become a problem later because you didn't have the proper expertise. If you do make a referral, uh, follow up with those patients afterwards. Sometimes just a simple follow-up. If they had a bad experience and you refer them somewhere, uh, you, one, you want to know about that, and two, uh, you don't want anything coming back on you. And At least if you follow up and say, okay, how was your experience with with dealing with so-and-so, did you get the problem taken care of, was somebody responsive? Now you know for, for future, and uh, and it'll also put a good taste in that person's mouth. At least they, they think, okay, you you tried to do what you could uh, to help me and uh, and refer me to somebody. It's not really your fault that that person didn't pan out. Uh, we've had situations like that happen. Uh, we try to, you know, again, in our business, it's a little bit different, but in, in law, if I have to make a referral, uh, I like to follow up with the client and with the uh, with the other lawyer to uh, to make sure that there's some type of meshing there. I usually uh, I usually will make a personal introduction as well uh, if I can do that to uh, to make sure that my uh, my client that I'm referring is is well taken care of or my maybe if, even if it's a person that's not a client but that I referred out that they're taken care of well. Obviously, don't get guarantee results and get in front of mistakes. Uh, usually, the easiest way to do this uh, is is to own the mistake or at least uh, acknowledge uh, or, or, or take responsibility to the extent necessary to uh, try and avoid complications and problems. Even if you think you don't have a responsibility for the initial, if, if you didn't make a mistake or it's not your responsibility, it's still a better practice oftentimes to try and help somebody uh, than rather than deal with uh, an issue later where they thought they were being ignored. Recognize your problem, patients, and clients. Uh, this is often easy. This, this, a lot of this comes with experience. Um, for anybody who provides professional services, after a while, you can you can see these folks, and you just know that it's not worth it. The 80-20 rule, it may even be the 90-10 or 95-5 rule. When you're talking about professional services and healthcare services, uh, it, it, you know, you'll have 
most of your problems are going to be from from very few people they're going to be difficult to satisfy these are going to be the people who aren't going to pay uh, these are going to be the people who make complaints who go on the internet and badmouth you uh, all types of problems the earlier you can recognize these folks and uh, and filter them out gracefully the better uh, of course you know this is sort of the the, uh, the golden rule of kindergarten avoid negative comments about others um, you know, if you don't say anything bad about anybody, it can't be used against you later. If uh, if you if you have somebody who is creating a negative environment, that can come up later in a lawsuit or some type of legal uh, proceeding, and uh, and those types of issues look terrible when they come up. Avoid personal risky behavior. Moving on to uh, disputes and threats, and uh, how to uh, identify uh, common issues and respond strategically. And that these types of disputes that we see on a regular basis are those uh, probably the most common we're seeing right now are those between uh, providers and payers. Uh, these are coming up a lot, and it's uh, uh, it's it's really surprising if you address these issues early, and and really try to get in front of them. By that I mean sometimes you have a maybe a a, um, uh, a an insurance company is is hitting you heavy with with auditing claims or denying claims uh, sometimes something as simple as getting on the phone with these folks and i've done this with clients and i've done it uh, on behalf of clients get on the phone with the proper folks at the insurance company give them a heads up of the issues that you want to discuss and try to come to a mutual agreement on how to solve the problem and i usually phrase that as uh, you know, something along the lines of Look, you know, my client so and so is providing the services. They're entitled to be paid for the services, and and your job as the uh, payer is to pay them for the services that they've provided, um, and and make sure that the patients are able to continue receiving services. How can we work together to make that happen? Where are we falling short in documentation, or where do you think we're falling short, or what can we better do do better to make your job easier so that you know. When a claim comes in that we've done everything we're supposed to do both from a service standpoint from a document standpoint so that you have a good comfort level in paying those claims so that we don't have to put a lot of time and energy into this uh, that type of approach versus the either a ignoring it or b wait a long time and then scream approach uh, that type of approach has has been very effective in building a rapport and helping our clients get paid for the work that they provide um, so you know it's a very common dispute and there's there's ways to deal with this very early on uh, obviously we've talked about patients things like informed consent and just you know what we might call bedside matter being nice to people paying a little bit of attention to making sure your staff uh, this goes a long way uh, towards uh, you know if people like you they don't want to come after you later they don't want to stiff you for money they don't want to sue you uh, so try to make people like you uh, employees, contractors, vendors, the common issues that come up here um, are, you know, anything from non-performance by an employee, employees stealing trade secrets, you should have any employees that have access to confidential information should have a written agreement that protects that confident, confidential information, that prohibits them from taking it uh, with them or disclosing it to anybody. You might have non-solicitation and non-compete provisions in certain agreements uh, when you're dealing with vendors. Uh, again, you should at least have some protection for your confidential in, uh, information in your intellectual property. You also want to make sure you have uh, clear payment rights in there, uh, but we see a lot of disputes because these things aren't real clear and because parties didn't communicate properly. Um, also, other types of disputes might be administrative with licensing. We help folks work through those issues. Again, a lot of that's communication and presenting things in the proper, uh, in the proper light. Um, hospitals competitors is there's the types of disputes and threats that we see uh, can come from all different angles and if you have any specific questions or you want to talk about anything specific please do let me know uh, when we are talking about responding uh, when you have a, a, a an issue that arises and there's a, a legal demand this can be anything from a demand letter uh, threat of a lawsuit or just the comments that are made you want to uh, make sure you have a good and sound assessment of both the factual and legal uh, issues 
uh, the factual issues or what happened? What do you understand as the, the healthcare provider or as the employer, uh, as the party on the ground? What are the, the what's the important information and documents uh, and things that were said, things that were done, services that were provided and so forth? The legal issues are things like what, uh, what portions of the contract control or is there a contract that controls? Uh, are there particular statutes or other legal authority that govern the party's uh, relationship? Uh, an example here is uh, an audit that I dealt with recently for a client where uh, the, the audit was based on the allegation that certain requirements weren't uh, met with the documentation. Uh, we disputed that, but we provided the necessary documentation to deal with that issue. That's where the client has the expertise. The client understands that I'm going to rely on a client to know their documents and their information and their system better than anybody else. So hopefully I'll be, uh, if, the, if something is, is ongoing, uh, I'll be as familiar with it as the client, but the client's going to have the best information. Then a legal issue might be something like extrapolation, which is just a, a horror show in the, in the context of audits. But we've seen now private payers trying to um, trying to deny claims or, or recoup claims in audits and then take a sampling and extrapolate that. And, uh, and my view on this is that I'm not convinced that the law allows a private payer. We see it in uh, with government contractors, but I'm not convinced that the law allows a private payer uh, to extrapolate. And I have specifically challenged that issue. And uh, anybody who's ever dealt with extrapolation knows that extrapolation can can take a six hundred a sixty thousand dollar claim and turn it into a six hundred thousand dollar claim. Uh, so it's just that simple legal issue can really change the context of what we're talking about. Uh, you want to have a good understanding of what the uh, relevant authority is, whether you're dealing with issues under a contract, whether you're dealing with uh, legal issues, or it's a combination of both of them. And uh, and that comes up in uh, often with patient disputes and billing disputes, but also in other issues as well. Uh, and, uh, and also, if somebody cites something in a contract or somebody cites the law and says, well, the law requires this, and you see that in a letter, verify that go look at it there's so many times that i've seen uh, demand letters or uh, something similar that refers to some type of authority whether it be contract authority or legal authority and i go look at it and i read it and i say that doesn't say that uh, there's there's no authority for that there's no authority in a private contract for extrapolation um, there's no uh, requirement in this contract that you know the, the, the provider have certain documentation. So don't rely on a letter. Go and look at the actual language and the citation. And if it's not in there, don't be afraid to ask the other side. What I'll do if I get a letter from somebody and take some position, if this is required, I'll, I'll ask, what's the authority for that? Uh, is that is there a law? Is there a statutory citation? Is there something you can cite me to? Can you point me to the provision in the contract that requires it? If not, then uh, why do you take the position that this is required? Um, that's that's going on right now with my with my telehealth uh, uh, case that I'm dealing with. Um, you know, the insurance company says certain requirements, certain things are required in order to provide telehealth, and I'm reading the telehealth law in Florida, and I'm not that that language that they're using is not in the statute. In my view, I don't think it's a fair interpretation of the statute. So we have a difference of opinion on what's actually required to provide services and get paid. Uh, preserving evidence and witnesses. Sometimes you'll get something like a legal hold letter or a legal demand, uh, a, a legal freeze or hold for information. If you get one of these, it's a good idea to contact an attorney right away. Um, and then uh, understanding that information has value in a lawsuit. Before you share anything or disclose information that the other side's not aware of, I like to always have some type of reason for doing that, a benefit, something you can get out of it. All right, I moved a little bit slower than I probably should have here. Let me hit on a few key issues. I've got about, I want to be able to take any other questions that folks have, um, but some other things to keep in mind in dealing with legal threats. Uh, when responding, attack issues and not people. Uh, So-and-so takes the position that this, that the contractor, that this is required. Attack that issue. Try not to attack the person. This is just a general rule, how I uh, like to respond to things. Don't make disputes personal if you can avoid it. It makes it much easier for somebody on the other side to uh, ex to make a change in their position and to modify their position if they just think we're dealing with an issue or a position and not them personally. 
if people think they're if they personalize issues they're much less uh, willing in my experience to uh, negotiate and uh, and resolve problems in a peaceful way uh, be wary of admissions this is, don't admit uh, anything without really giving it a lot of thought. Earlier, you'd think that would conflict with what I said earlier about owning mistakes. That's different. You can try to correct perceived mistakes and do so in a tactful way without admitting that you made a mistake and say, look, we don't think we did anything wrong here, but I want to help you with this. Uh, and, and be careful with concessions and when you're negotiating with folks, especially in the context of a legal demand always try to understand what the other side wants what's the goal of the other side sometimes this isn't entirely clear and as a lawyer i find myself sometimes asking uh, the lawyer on the other side if i'm dealing with a lawyer hey, what does your client want what are they looking for what's going to make them happy i also want to ask my client what's going to make you happy what's going to how are you going to what's going to be a, what, how do you define success if there's a dispute going on if you have a problem with another party never miss an opportunity to uh make yourself look like the good guy and let someone else look like the bad guy. You're the problem solver. You're the one who wants to resolve the other side's problem. Um, or I shouldn't say make someone else look like the bad guy, but let them look like the bad guy. Let other people you know, take the irrational positions and, and you deal with problems in a problem solving manner, not in an attacking mode. Uh, also, this is an important issue here. Privileges and immunities that come with counsel. Things that you discuss with an attorney. If you're thinking about hiring a consultant to review, for instance, to do internal audits, if the attorney hires that consultant, we don't have to disclose that information because that's attorney work product information. And so if somebody asks you for it, if, a, if another paying company or, or government or anybody asks you for the results of any internal audits, if you've done them, you have to turn those over in uh, many legal proceedings. But if an attorney orders those, we can take the position that that information is confidential because it's attorney work product. There are several privileges and immunities that are available when dealing with lawyers, and you should take advantage of those. Uh, I've identified here two particular types of, of threats about which to be very cautious. The first are dealing with government agencies. Obviously, um, this is really because of the regulatory and the criminal components that uh, are criminal implications that come with uh, government investigations. We Our antenna goes up very fast and very high whenever there's a government inquiry about anything. We want to make sure that we're responding timely and uh, and we're giving the, the proper information in, in, in the proper form and context. Um, also, if you're dealing with government inquiries, again, consider the advantages of using somebody, using a lawyer to negotiate and discuss things on your behalf. The lawyer can be the guy who's, who says, no, we're not going to do that. If, if somebody asks a question of a government uh, investigator, says, you know, why was this done or what does this mean? I can be on, on a call with somebody or in a meeting and say, you know, I don't know. I have to go find out. But if you're the client, even if I know the answer, I can say that. If I just don't want to answer it, I want to think more about what type of how we're going to respond to something, I can say, I don't know. Um, if the client has a lawyer and the client's asked, the client say, you know what, I need to discuss that with my lawyer. But if you're representing yourself and you're dealing with these types of issues, and I don't know, sounds very bad. Uh, so let somebody else be the bad guy and be the middle guy in these types of negotiations. Uh, and the second uh, audit uh, or second dispute is, is payer audits. Again, I mentioned earlier, we've been seeing a lot of these. And uh, payer audits, this is all about being ready to respond properly to audit inquiries uh, this involves reading what the requirements are carefully, following the requirements of your uh, of your contract and other documents, um, and, uh, and providing complete and full and timely information and being ready to challenge results. Uh, we've had a lot of success where uh, the payers initially say, uh, we disagree, we're going to recoup X amount of dollars, and that ultimately gets reduced once we just start, once we get involved and dig further into the issues. Uh, and, and it doesn't necessarily mean you have to involve a legal proceeding, uh, but, but understand that just because the, the company says something, you don't have to go along with it. You can actually press that issue a little bit harder. And disputes and threats, uh, here's some ideas to keep in mind, uh, things to, to do and don't do. Obviously, deadlines are important, but recognize fake ones. Sometimes you get a letter from a 
uh, a, a vendor or an employee that says, if you don't respond in 24 hours, you know, you need to respond within 24 hours. Well, you know, is that a real deadline or is that just, you know, or what? And that's what I ask clients. If I send a demand last night, okay, if they don't comply, if they don't give us what, what we're looking for, what is going to be our response? What are we going to do about it? Think about that from the very beginning. And when you respond to other folks, understand what's a real versus a fake deadline. Uh, of course, don't ignore threats uh, and demands, but um, make sure you, you're responding reasonably to those. Uh, Sometimes you, if you have a, a legal issue that arises, you may have a duty to report that to somebody else, such as an employer or a contracting uh, organization, uh, licensing board, et cetera, insurance company. Uh, again, if you're not sure, this is a good idea, again, to, uh, to consult with counsel. Uh, don't be afraid to properly supplement records, and I've done that in connection with payer audits. Uh, where maybe some records weren't in a file, but were certainly accessible and available, and we provided those, but that doesn't mean that we're going to be uh, altering documents or altering a file. Uh, we're going to be honest about it, but sometimes there's opportunities to supplement records, and, uh, and we do that when we can if it's going to help us resolve an issue. Always consider your settlement options and your alternatives to, uh, to legal action. Um, that this is just all along the process of disputes and threats. I tell folks all the time uh, that uh, lawsuits are not a happy place to be if you're in any type of business, especially if you're in a business of trying to provide healthcare services to folks. It's stressful, it's time consuming, it takes away from your business, it takes a lot of energy, it's expensive. Uh, if we can get you away from these problems early on, that's going to be our goal. If you find yourself involved in a lawsuit, um, the first thing uh, you need to do is you need to figure out what does, you know, start looking right away about how to get yourself you know, out of it. If you're going to initiate a lawsuit, then uh, what does success, why are you doing this and what does success look like? What are you trying to accomplish? What's the goals? Um, if you are, uh, if you find yourself in a lawsuit, that somebody else has sued you or if you're in another type of proceeding in arbitration or something similar, Again, try to identify what would be a success for you and for the other side, and uh, try to open up lines of communication where possible. You also want to do things like preserving evidence and witnesses, taking witness statements as quick as possible, um, trying to create a timeline of events, identifying the, the, the documents that are going to be uh, at issue. And when we're talking about paying for, um, for these types of disputes, uh, first thing you should be looking at is, do you have insurance that might cover it? Um, and even if you have insurance that'll cover it, will, will they select your counsel to represent you? Or if they, uh, or will they let you select counsel? And if they select counsel, do you want to get your own personal counsel? Because you always have to keep in mind with insurance companies, uh, with the counsel that insurance company hires, they have, a, they have a duty not only to you, but to, the, you know, they're getting paid by somebody else. So in certain circumstances, it's valuable to have your own counsel to advise you separately uh, to work hand in hand with insurance counsel, but also advise you separately as, your own, as to your own personal rights and, uh, and, and what's available to you. Uh, also contractual indemnity is another issue. Is there another party that you can look to for recovery? Uh, similar to that in disputes, is there some language in a contract or a statute that entitles you to recover your legal fees? Uh, so can you recover those through indemnity or is there some other mechanism, a fee shifting mechanism in a, in a uh, statute or a contract? In Florida, if there's no attorney fee provision in a statute or a contract, then generally each side pays their own fees. This can have dramatic implications for a lawsuit. The longer something goes on, the more it becomes, uh, especially any dispute that involves money, the more it's going to become tougher to settle something as a case gets further and further along because the legal fees become so extraordinarily high. Then with that point, I also say again, explore early resolutions. Uh, Understand uh, with with any lawsuit, you should have a theory of your case. Um, you know what happened, uh, what how did you end up where you are, and uh, you should, it should be able to tell a story. Your your case should tell a story, and and it should have a result uh, that's a fair result. You also under, want to understand your opponent's theory. And I put here: is there another theory? Yes, there is a third theory. Uh, at least a third, and uh, and that is if there is a fact finder, if you're in court, there's a jury or a judge, or there's an arbitrator or somebody making a decision. If you're in a private trial, um, then then that person will have their own theory of what happened, which is oftentimes a blend of the parties' theories. 
and, and that's what's going to carry the day unless the parties can reach some type of resolution or settlement themselves. Finally, here are some do's and don'ts. Don't keep facts from your lawyer, but understand that if you disclose something to your lawyer, your lawyer may be, uh, especially with documents, uh, your lawyer may be required to turn things over to the other side in the form of documents, but your lawyer cannot share information that you tell them as attorney-client communications. So if you say, well, we have this file on so-and-so that we've been keeping, when, when you, you're required, oftentimes, if you have a dispute involving that issue, you're going to be required to produce that file. And if you tell the lawyer and you don't want to present, uh, if you don't want to present the file, uh, understand that when you tell your lawyer, your lawyer is going to be required to, to make you turn that file over. Um, but you're required to do it. Now, on information that you share with your lawyer on legal strategy and, and talking to your lawyer, you can disclose anything to your lawyer. Your lawyer is required to keep that confidential with the very uh, narrow exceptions of uh, any types of uh, ongoing fraud or criminal acts. Um, there are exceptions for fraud and criminal acts, but most of the people that we deal with on a regular basis aren't involved in that, and so it doesn't become an issue. Your lawyer is gonna be in a better position to help defend you and represent you if they understand everything from the beginning. Um, and then don't assert inappropriate policy arguments such as you know something should be permissible that's not, and, and again, understand that's different than saying, look, I'm reading a statute, you're reading a statute, you're interpreting that statute this way with language that's not in it. I'm interpreting it different. That's a reasonable dispute. But we both read the same statute and I say, well, that's that's a stupid law. That shouldn't be the law. The law should be something different. That argument's going to lose. Uh, so understand the difference in that and try to avoid fighting over principle. Principle is never a good reason. It's usually just an expensive way to uh, to enrich lawyers. Um, and, and you find that it's just not that rewarding at the end oftentimes to fight over principle regardless of, uh, of what type of how you define win and, and what that looks like in the end. Uh, know that uh, on the do side it, all computer information now is, uh, is, is documented in your index files on a computer. It's really tough to bury that stuff. Um, so understand that uh, there's going to be a trail for everything. There's usually going to be a paper trail. Now it's a digital paper trail. Also, sometimes you just have bad facts. Sometimes somebody did something wrong. You have to own that. And that's where I put understand uh, your reality. Lawyers are not magicians. Uh, we will make the best uh, um, uh, arguments for you. We can try to interpret things in the best light for you. But uh, if a party is wrong, sometimes they're just wrong. And you just have to own that. Uh, and now we just try and reduce the damage. We're in damage control mode. Uh, business and personal counsel can be different folks. This often we see, for instance, in malpractice cases. I'm getting, I don't do malpractice defense, but I do a lot of asset protection and we deal with business structure issues and personal planning. So I'm often engaged to provide uh, personal advice to uh, a physician or other healthcare provider who's being sued in a malpractice case and I'm really just advising them on ex issues with exposure and dealing with the insurance company and dealing with the other side and how that can play out. And I'll come to a wrap up here is let's say you have a million dollars insurance coverage and the, the party on the other side is suing you for five million dollars. Well, you've got an issue because you don't have enough insurance coverage to cover the lawsuit, but the party on the other side thinks, well, I'm suing this rich doctor and I'm going to get paid. And if you've done some of the stuff that I suggested in the first couple slides, which is planning your properly structuring not only your business, but your personal assets, I can come in later and say, look, I'm not hired by the insurance company. I'm not going to argue or talk about the merits of the particular claim or lawsuit or any damages that allegedly occurred. But what I can tell you is that if you get a judgment that's more than a million dollars, the insurance company will pay you the first million. And then after that, you've got to collect the rest. Nobody's just writing you a check. And then I can explain why it's going to be difficult or impossible to collect the rest because this particular client of mine, this doctor, is not exposed because their assets are structured in such a way to avoid uh, personal liability for issues that arose in this lawsuit. That is, uh, is, is incredibly a, an effective way to settle cases uh, and not litigate them. That's what I talked about at the beginning. Proper structure, proper personal planning helps to settle uh, and reduce Risks in lawsuit helps to settle claims in lawsuits, resolve disputes, because parties come to the reality that they're uh, that they understand that their remedies and their options are going to be limited in the long term. It helps bring about a, a, a quicker, uh, realistic resolution. Um, 
And uh, always think strategically. Knowledge is power in a lawsuit and uh, any type of dispute. And, uh, and when you're setting up your business again, that brings us to the end. I went right over, I think I'm at a minute one here on the presentation. And with that, have a great rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you.